Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Prospect Charter School's Algebra 1 course. Today we're going to be going over section 2.8 applications of proportions. In the previous class we learned about what proportions were and what ratios were and saw some uses of it in kind of our daily life. Now we're going to look at it from more of a geometry perspective and also from a uh, engineer's perspective and from a biologist's perspective. So what we have is something called similar figures. So similar figures are shapes that have all the same angles and proportionate sides. So we're looking at shapes that have basically the same size or basically the same shape but different sizes. For an example, let's say for a moment that I have a square. And this square has a side length of one. If I was to make that square bigger and have a side length of 3 instead of 1, then these two would be similar. They have the same angles, but they have different size side length. However, if I was to take a triangle with a side length of 3 and turn it into a rectangle with a side length of 2 and 3 this would actually be not similar because you're changing your shape. You're going from a triangle to a rectangle. You can't change shapes. You have to keep the same shape. You have to keep the same angles. The only thing that can change is its size. Now the cool thing that I can show you is that if I have a rectangle well, that is that big, if I take it and I change its size, it is similar to the previous rectangle. So these two rectangles that you see flipping back and forth in size are similar rectangles or similar squares. Now if I was to take the same thing with a triangle, if I had a triangle and I decided to make it larger or smaller, oops, I didn't mean to move it, I meant to make it bigger, right? Then it's the same similar shape to the previous one. So these two triangles are similar, those two rectangles were similar, but the triangle and the rectangle will never be similar to each other because they're not the same shape. Okay, now a cool thing about this is that corresponding angles corresponding angles are the same angle in each shape. So for an example, if you look at this triangle, right, we have a right angle right here. Now if I was to make a similar triangle, if it'll let me pick it up, it won't let me pick it up, okay. Now if I was to take make a similar triangle next to it, I would say that the angles in pink are corresponding because they're the same. The angles in purple are corresponding because they're in the same location. And the angles in blue would be corresponding because they're also in the same location. Purple will not be the same as blue unless you have a, a special triangle. Blue will not be the same as pink and pink will not be the same as purple or, or blue. So they're all going to be different. They're all corresponding angles, <coughs> but the one in here, this purple, 
is going to be the exact same as the one in here. So for an example, if I had a triangle where this angle was 30 degrees and this angle was 60 degrees, and then I had another one that was drawn a little bit smaller, say this is a length of five and this was a length of uh, two, then this angle up here, which we would call A prime, would also be 30 degrees. And this angle down here, which we would call B prime, would be 60 degrees. And angle C and C prime, can you guess? Yep, they're both 90 degrees. So corresponding angles are angles that arrive in the same location. They're always going to be congruent. They're always going to be the same. And corresponding sides of similar objects are a common proportion of each other. So let, let's go back to the triangle example again on this one. Let's say for a moment I have a triangle over here that has um, three, four, and five for its side lengths. If I was to make another triangle that was bigger, whose sides lengths were 6, 10, and 15, would these be course or uh, would these be similar? Well, we would look at their corresponding sides. So 3 and 6 would be a corresponding side. To turn that into a proportion or a ratio, I would say 3 to 6. And then we have 5 and 15. Those would also be corresponding sides. So I would have a ratio of 5 to 15. By the way, what is 3 to 6? 3 divided by 6 is 1 half, right? And then 5 over 15, they're both divisible by 5, would give us 1 third. Is one half equal to one third? No, so these would be not similar. What numbers would we have to have to make them similar? Well, I'm going to keep the three, four, five, but I'm going to change the one on the right. So we have a ratio of 3 to 6. That has to be the ratio of my other two sides, y and x. So 3 to 6 has to be the same ratio as y to its corresponding side, which is 4. So I think we know how to solve this one, right? Cross multiply. 12 is equal to 6y y is equal to 2. That doesn't seem right. Oh, I got that upside down, didn't I? That's going to make a big difference, isn't it? Because this is from my original, that's from the new. So I need to have my original on top, which would be 4, and my new on the bottom, which would be y. Now when I cross multiply, I get 3y is equal to 24, and so y is equal to 8. Got to remember, when you're doing your proportions, the same things have to be in the same places. You have your original over your new, original over your new. If you do it backwards, you kind of get numbers that don't work out nicely. Okay. So let's go to the last one. What about the 5 and the x? Well, we would have 
3 from my original is equal to 6 from the new, so that should be equal to 5 from my original and an unknown number from my new. Then we cross multiply, x times 3 is 3x, 6 times 5 is 30, divide both sides by 3 and we get x is equal to 10. Now they are similar because they all have the same ratio. 3 to 6 is really 1 half. 5 to 10, well they're both divisible by 5, that's really 1 half. 4 to 8, again 1 half. So that would make them similar triangles because their corresponding sides are all of the same proportion and all of their angles are the same. All right, let's move on to our next example of when we would see it being used in an interesting uh, real life application, which is measuring the heights of trees. So we need to know how tall is that thing. This is actually used a lot, especially when you're doing engineering, when you're looking at um, biology and trying to figure out how old the tree is, when you're trying to figure out uh, whether, where you can put your airport or which trees that you have to cut down for, for your flight line, etc. Knowing how tall something is is a very useful thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a way that we can find how tall something that is really, 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 really tall, how tall it is without having to climb it. Because if you haven't noticed, some of those trees out in the woods, they're, they're pretty tall. And I wouldn't want to have to climb every tree in the woods to find out how tall they are. It's very time consuming and it's really hard and it's hard on the tree, it's hard on the person, it's just a bad idea. So let's say for a moment that we have a tree that we don't know how tall it is. But we do know that it casts a shadow that is 45 feet long. And then we have a person who is not Mr. O'Neill and this person, because he's not Mr. O'Neill, is six feet tall. And we measure the length of his shadow, and his shadow is three feet long. How tall is the tree? Well, to figure that out, we have similar shapes, right? If we're looking at it, the sun kind of shines down and causes us to have a little bit of a triangle. When we're standing straight up, we can assume that we have a ni nice right angle. And so we have two similar triangles. And when we have similar triangles, we can use that ratio thing again, right? So we have 45 feet is the length of the shadow of the tree. Three feet is the length of the shadow of the person. Well, that has to be equal to how tall the tree is, which is unknown, in comparison to how tall the person is, which is six feet. Note how this is a little bit different than the previous one. Remember, as long as you keep everything the same in the same slot, you're fine. Like before, we would probably have y over 45 is equal to and then something else, but I don't want to do that. I want to keep it uh, easy for me. I like having my y in the numerator because that makes the math easy. Well, arithmetic easy. So normally I would just immediately start by cross multiplying, but um, six times 45 is a big number. I wanna to try to avoid that. So what Mr. O'Neill would do first is reduce. Does that mean that you have to reduce first all the time? No. Is it going to change the ratio? Well, no, because 1 half is the same thing as 2 over 4. It's not going to change its actual value. All we're going to do is make our arithmetic easier. So I do 45 divided by 3, and I get 30. So I have 30 is equal to y over 6. To get y by itself, I'd multiply both sides by 6. So I have 6 times 30 is equal to y, 
y is equal to 180. So this tree, the tree, is 180 feet tall. I think I did that right. Oh, 45 divided by 3. I'm going to check that. 45 divided by 3 is 15. Oops. So if this is 15, that means that this is 15. And if that's 15, that means this is 90. So that means that my tree is 90 feet tall. Well, that's why we always double check stuff, right? Sometimes doing your mental arithmetic, you're off by a little bit. Eh, that's fine, as long as you double check. And that's what this thing is for. It's a double checker to make sure that you did it correctly. It's not to be used as your primary resource, though. Even though you will make mistakes without using it, by not using it. All right. And that's it for today's lesson.